come back to the rest of the series as well or any other time. Uh, you know, we're very proud of uh, you know our Trout Library here, and it's, it's open to the public and it's always available. Uh, so we're, we're glad to see you here. Uh, and just a, a quick infomercial for those of you who, uh, who may not be as familiar with Arkham. You know, we're a two-year private college, and uh, we've been around, as you know, now for 100 years. Uh, you know, we specialize a lot uh, in allied health programs, uh, but we also have uh, business and services, really childhood. We have some design programs, some fashion design, interior design. Uh, so we we do a bunch of different things. Uh, we've been growing over the past few years. Uh, our total enrollment now is about 1,600 uh, for about 800 a few years back. So we're, we're in growth mode and things are, are going well. So we, we have a chance here to celebrate and uh, very fortunate to have Judy Brooks with you with us here tonight. And I'm going to turn it over to Danielle Dunn to do the formal introduction. Danielle is our director of uh, career transfer. Uh, so Danielle, take it over. Okay. Thank you all for coming out tonight. We're glad, we are glad that you are here tonight for building a new economy with love got to do with it. Presented by Judy Wicks, founder of the White Dog Cafe and local economy pioneer. Following Judy's presentation, there will be a formal question and answer period, followed by a book signing and light refreshments. Feel free to grab snacks and find a corner anywhere in the library to sit back with your friends and classmates and colleagues and reflect on the wonderful presentation that we're about to hear tonight. Make sure you enter the drawing for a prize by putting your name, email, and an email address or business card into the fishbowl in front of the library. We'll select one prize winner after Judy's presentation today. Now on to our speaker. Ben Cohen of everyone's favorite ice cream manufacturer, Ben & Jerry, said, Judy Wicks is one of the most amazing women he's ever met. Mike Schumann of Local Dollars, Local Sense suggested that Judy win the Nobel Prize in Planet Saving. Judy Wicks teaches us how to succeed in business while managing from the heart in a world that works for all, said David Courtney, co-founder of Yes Magazine. We have a unique problem in our time, she states, in her memoir, Good Morning Beautiful Business, Climate change, wealth inequity, declining oil supplies, and escalating global violence. We are fortunate to have an opportunity to hear about Judy's unique vision for a better world. Without further ado, please welcome Judy Witz.
So this was my first community, a small town in, in western Pennsylvania called Ingemar. And uh, this was the busiest intersection because that's where the beer distributor was located. <laughs> uh, selling Iron City uh, beer and Rolling Rock that were uh, made nearby. And uh, it was in Ingemar that I first witnessed the role that small business owners play in community life. I would go with my mom or my grandmother to the butcher store and the butcher would always say, well, how was that steak last Saturday night? Or how was that turkey on Thanksgiving? Because they knew what farm that the, the meat came from. The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, these are the foundational relationships uh, in community life that so often uh, we've lost. So another important influence for me uh, was living with indigenous people. Uh, in this case, an Eskimo village in Alaska when I graduated from college in the old days of 1969, I joined VISTA and was sent to work in an Eskimo village in Alaska. And from the Eskimos, I learned um, a worldview of the um, culture of uh, sharing and cooperation, uh, which was different from what I experienced in our consumer-based economy uh, growing up. For instance, um, the Eskimos have a tradition of a seal party. When a man catches his first seal, his wife has a party and invites everyone over. Uh, and she divides the meat between all the families. Here's a bucket full of seal meat and blubber, and then anything else that the family has that they don't need for survival is then passed out to the other families. Uh, the women are bundling things up in their skirts that act as pockets. And then at the um, end of the, uh, the party, uh, candy uh, is thrown into the air. And I was right up there. There wasn't a lot to do up there. And so I loved it when there was a seal party, and I would hope to get root beer barrels, my favorite <laughs> candy. So the, um, the Eskimos had no sense of envy. If you admire something uh, an Eskimo has, uh, like if I said, I love that uh, luck skin scarf you're wearing. If you're an Eskimo, you give it to me. But hey, please don't. <laughs> you have to watch out what you admire when you're around Eskimos. Uh, so um, you know, also that you know, I, I realized that as a young person how our economy is really driven by envy. You know, through advertising. You know, we're, we're, we we want to have that. Uh, the lipstick or the dress or whatever that the pretty model has or or smoke the same cigarette or drink the same beer or is the macho guy and same kind of car or whatever that um, we, we were um, brainwashed really to advertising to want more and more and more and never be satisfied with how much we have. Uh, the Eskimos were the happiest people that I've ever met and I realized it was that their happiness was not based on money or, their, or material possessions their happiness and their sense of security was really based on, on community. Uh, and again, that's something that we've often lost in, in contemporary times. So my first business uh, was in Philadelphia. Um, it was called the Free People Store. And I started it in 1970 uh, with my first husband when we were just back from the Eskimo village. And we, uh, we only had uh, $3,000, so we had to figure out how to use it wisely. And we would do things like buy uh, long underwear that was traditional white and then dye them pink for some outlandish color. And here's a pair I used to uh, put the open and close on in the back flap of the, <laughs> of the long <laughs> um, And we, uh, we didn't have money to buy uh, shelving, so we went to Chinatown on garbage day and collected all the, the wooden crates that were used to ship goods from China to uh, Philadelphia. And I, my hobby as a child was uh, building forts up in the woods, so I was very good with the hammer and nails. And so I, I built these shelves out of scrap wood and painted them different colors. And our merchandise was all things that our age group would like. We used to say back in the 60s that you can't trust anyone over 30. So we thought, well, we wouldn't sell to anyone over 30. These are, this, these are all, it was kind of a general store uh, for students um, in, in uh, West Philadelphia, the 43rd and um, Locust. So you can see them. Uh, candles and dangly earrings and frisbees and macrame uh, belts and mattress bedspreads and uh, Mexican glasses, all that kind of thing. Clothing. Uh, we also used these uh, discarded wooden spools from the electric company for our center tables. Um, and we sold t-shirts and jeans. That's me taking a picture and you can see me in the mirror wearing my, my bell bottoms. And here I am with some of our peasant dresses. Uh, and I'll read you a little bit from this chapter of my life. In the beginning, we couldn't buy our jeans from a big brand name like Levi Strauss and Company because we couldn't make the minimum order. All we could afford was to buy three pairs and three sizes from a lesser known brand. 
Once we squares, we bought three pairs of purple velvet bell-bottom jeans, a big investment for us. They were the most expensive items in the store, and we were eager to sell them so we could buy six more pairs, then 12, and so on. The purple velvet jeans led to something we hadn't yet thought about. One day, when I was in the store alone, a group of 10 or 12 high school girls descended on the store all at once. I was trying desperately to keep my eye on each of them as they asked me questions to draw me to different parts of the store. Suddenly, they all left as they had come at once, and I noticed with dismay as they hurried out the door that one of the girls was wearing a pair of the purple velvet jeans. Stop, they're my jeans, I cried out, and they took off running. I locked the door and gave chase. Up the street and around the corner we went, dodging traffic across a busy thoroughfare. I was gaining ground, and as the group reached the parking lot at the supermarket at the corner of 44th and Walnut, I lunged and tackled the culprit to the ground. Without thinking, I unzipped the jeans and yanked them off her. <laughs> as she lay on the sidewalk in her underpants screaming, I ran back to the store and immediately and triumphantly returned our purple velvet jeans to the shelf. I was determined that we would sell that pair and more and more and more until someday Levi Strauss and Company would be very glad to sell to us. So as it turned out, uh, they were very glad to sell to us because the store uh, grew and grew and became um, a store called Urban Outfitters, which is now like uh, you know international chain. And my first husband uh, is still the CEO and chair of the board. Um, but after about two years, I decided that the guy that was first my boyfriend when I was 10 years old um, was not the person I wanted to be married to any longer. You have to read the book to find out why, but I decided I would leave. So I'll read you a paragraph here. His name is uh, Dick Hain. Dick Hain. Dick's and my lives would take drastically different turns. He continued on with a free people's store, and I had no idea where life was leading when I packed my bags and left my husband home and business. I got only a block away when I ran a red light and collided with another car. Luckily, no one was hurt. The car I was using could not be driven. A passerby offered to help me home. But I can't go home. I've just left my husband. My bags are packed and I've got to keep going, I poured out as we stood on the sidewalk. And now I have to find a job fast because I need money to repair the car. Maybe I can help, said the passerby, a very friendly, blonde, curly-haired young man about my age. I work in a restaurant called La Terrasse on the 3400 block of Sanson Street near the university, and they have an opening for a waitress. I'll take it, I said immediately, as if I were talking to the person who was hiring me. And so that's how I got to the restaurant business that would be my life for the next 40 years, quite by accident. <laughs> so, moving along. This was the 3400 block of Sansa Street, um, in a watercoloring that was done maybe 100 years ago. Uh, but the houses uh, are pretty much the same, these beautiful Victorian brownstone houses with a little gingerbread along the, the top. Uh, and this is where I decided that I wanted to live and start a business, raise my family, and so on. And I believe that taking responsibility for a place uh, is the first step in building a sustainable local economy. Uh, to really make a commitment to a place, become knowledgeable of the place, where does our water come from, where does our electricity come from, where does our food come from, where does our waste go, uh, and to build a community uh, in that place. Uh, so I'm, I'm skipping ahead because I'm the whole chapter on Lateros where I went as a waitress and became the general manager, became a partner in the business, and then left and started uh, the White Dog Cafe. Uh, oh, there we go. Oh, that. So that's the White Dog Cafe, um, and it started in, uh, let's see, started in 1983 as a muffin shop. There's the muffin counter. So that's what we just had muffins and juice and coffee, and we didn't even have any tables and chairs. Um, we eventually had a Tables and chairs out front, and then gradually built the business. When I moved to wanting to serve hot food, I didn't have enough money to put the exhaust system up to the house, so we put a charcoal grill in the backyard, and the chef uh, stayed out there. On uh, the winter, we built a kind of a plastic tent around it. Uh, the, the chef would be out there in a park and boots and whatnot. Uh, when the waiters wanted to pick up the, need to pick up the food, they'd go down the basement out the door and pick up the food. Uh, the dishwasher was a three bowl sink in the corner of the dining room, and if, when you finished your, your, your dinner, you would just um, pass your dirty plates over to the dishwasher, and he would wash them as he chatted with you in, uh, in the dining room. If you needed to use the restroom, you were directed upstairs to our house, where you would wave at our children um, as you made your way to the family bathroom. <laughs> so, so that's how we began. And uh, in the uh, first the summer, we had a, a, a dining room outside which next to the grill which was the favorite place to to sit and um, my kids and I who were two and four at the time would go over to the Penn campus and hand out flyers uh, advertising the restaurant and would run back and peek over the fence
us to see if anybody had come. <laughs> so, so very, very simply. Uh, but we grew, um, this is the addition that was built over that outdoor dining room. Uh, we grew to see 200 people, but employ about um, 100 employees uh, and about $5 million in business. And uh, here's a, a little story about those early days. Uh, I was very eager to get my liquor license because I wanted to be able to serve um, the new American beer that I had just uh, tried. It, Anybody ever sampled um, Anchor Steam here from San Francisco? Mm -hmm. It's a really great beer, and I had never had beer other than the sort of the watery um, old, old corporate beer <laughs> we were used to when we were in college, and so I was very excited about um, uh, getting my liquor license so I could serve this particular beer. And uh, I'll read a little passage from this time. This was in 1985. I was finally able to begin serving the new American beers I was longing for. Customers were surprised when they came into the bar and ordered a popular beer like Heineken to be told that we didn't carry the brand. Then how about a lone bra? No. Well, then I'll take a loaf. Not bad either. Then just give me a bud. Sorry, but how about one of these beers? Handing over our beer list, mighty short at the time, the bartender explained that the white dog carried only beers from small independent breweries, later called craft or microbrews, where beers is a brewed in small batches. I soon discovered that unlike wine, beer is best when fresh and without preservatives needed for long distance shipping, just like local food. So I upped the ante. Not only did I want flavorful all-American beer, I became determined to have beer that was local, fresh, and made without preservatives. So I was thrilled to hear in 1987 that an excellent new brewery had opened just 60 miles to the west in Adamstown. It was not only the first new brewery in Pennsylvania since Prohibition, but it was owned by a woman. I immediately called up the owner, Carol Stout, and that's her picture there and asked about ordering her beer. At first, Carol thought 60 miles was too far for her beer to travel. <laughs> she was in the local too. But I was convinced to sell, uh, convinced her to sell to me. And she drove into town with a keg strapped into her passenger seat with a seatbelt. <laughs> we laughed about that years later when Carol was celebrating the 20th anniversary of Stout's Brewery after winning many a gold medal at the Great American Beer Festival. It wasn't long before Stout's began brewing our private label beer in 22 ounce bottles. I named it Leg Lifter Lager and drew this uh, <laughs> label. <laughs> and it's a very popular beer. So here are my kids, uh, Grace and Lawrence, out in front of the white dog. And I put their picture in because I wanted to make the point that I was living and working in the same community. I was actually living above the shop, an old fashioned way of doing business, like the family farm or the, the, the old uh, corner stores where, in the cities where families would live upstairs. <coughs> And there's something about living and working in the same place uh, that helps to define a business uh, perspective. Because oftentimes, uh, we're told to leave our values at home and go to work. Uh, so it's uh, teach the golden rule uh, when you're at home um, and working with your kids, being a good model to your kids. Uh, but then when you get to work, the golden rules, uh, that decisions are made uh, according to the bottom line. So when we live and work in the same community, you have the same values. You don't compartmentalize values. And you're also closer to those effect, affected by your business decisions. A short distance between the business decision maker and those affected, like the employees, the customers, the neighbors, the um, natural environment, the man-made environment, you can actually see what uh, the effects are of your decision, unlike today's CEOs, where sometimes they never see uh, the people or places affected by their decisions. So I feel that when you live and work in the same community, that there's a balance of the head and heart uh, when you make decisions. And I'll give you some examples of that. The person on the uh, right is Greg Coleman, who was a longtime dishwasher at the White Dog. This picture was actually taken in uh, Havana, Cuba, because we had an international sister restaurant project, and, and the um, Cuban woman is wearing one of our t-shirts that says, Cable for Five Billion, Please. Uh, that was the name of our sister restaurant. I, I once walked into a restaurant instead of asking for a table for two or for four. I said, oh, I'd like a table for five billion, please. Imagining a world where everyone had a place at the table, politically and economically, and everyone had enough to eat. So we would take groups of our customers and um, staff to countries that were uh, uh, that the United States government didn't like, basically. Uh, and uh, we called it eating with the enemy. So we went to uh, Cuba and Vietnam and the Soviet Union and um, Nicaragua during the Civil War and so on. So anyway, uh, the reason I put this slide up is I wanted to talk about uh, paying a living wage. 
And when I first heard about the idea of a living wage, which is the voluntary commitment on the part of a business owner to pay not just the federally required minimum wage, but what does it actually cost for a person to live in a particular city? Um, and when I first heard about it, I thought, oh, well, that's a really lovely idea, but it would never work in the restaurant business. How could you pay entry-level dishwashers um, a living wage, which back then, this was maybe 15 years ago, was $8 an hour. Now it's probably more like 12 or 15. Um, but at, at the time, it seemed like a lot of money, and I thought, well, it just wouldn't work in the restaurant business. And then um, one day I was in the kitchen, and Greg and two other uh, dishwashers, prep people, looked up at me while they were filling potatoes or carrots or whatever, and all of a sudden, the light bulb went off in my head. And I thought, oh my gosh, I want Greg to be able to, he works here full time at the White Dog, I want him to be able to pay his rent and buy his food and his clothes, of course I want to pay a living wage. What, what have I been thinking about? Uh, and so I raised our, our entry level um, uh, wage in, uh, to, to the living wage. Uh, but this came about because of my relationship, my direct relationship, uh, and my concern and care for the people that I worked with. Another example of balancing head and heart uh, is my relationship with nature. Um, I would love to go up to the Poconos uh, to go hiking, and one time during a drought, I forget what year this was, but again, it was somewhere around 15 years ago or so, uh, I um, saw that the leaves were beginning to fall off the trees uh, in August. And when I got to Fern Hill, where usually there's big, beautiful green ferns like waving in the breeze, they were all crinkled up like brown tissue paper on the floor of the forest. And as I walked along, it was just a eerie silence. Uh, not even the birds were singing. There was just a, a fear of fire was in the air. Um, and uh, and I, all of a sudden, I just got it. You know, I, 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 had, I knew about climate change. And I knew that in, in Philadelphia, we could sign up for renewable energy. But I, I hadn't really put the two together. I hadn't been motivated to sign up for renewable energy. Uh, but when I saw that the place I loved uh, was being affected, I went over to a big, I uh, became a tree hugger. I went over to a big tree and hugged the tree and pressed my face against the bark and promised I would go back to town and figure out how to sign up for renewable energy. And the White Dog became the first business in Pennsylvania to buy 100% of our electricity from renewable sources. And of course, I continue that uh, today. I've sold the, the restaurant, but I in my own home, uh, I buy 100% renewable, and I, I hope all of, uh, all of you do too. That's one of the basic things we can do to, um, to confront uh, climate change, is to use renewable energy. Uh, so um, another example of um, balancing head and heart is my relationship with my community. I was stopped at a red light in West Philadelphia in front of West Philly High and watching the students uh, come out of the school. And I was thinking to myself, well, this is the school my kids would go to because that I send my kids to a Quaker school, to a private Quaker school. And so I don't even know the kids that are in my own neighborhood school. I want to know who they are. Um, so we had, um, I went to the principal and suggested that we have a mentoring program uh, for uh, 10th and 11th graders uh, at West Philly uh, who would like to go into the hospitality business and give them experience working in the, in the kitchen, the dining room, the office, and so on. Um, and then at the end of the year, we would have an event called uh, the Hip Hop, and the kids uh, helped us put on the event, um, and they took the profits to use for <coughs> and whatnot. Um, they picked a DJ, and one time, uh, and helped with food and so on, and uh, the kid with the blue cap was uh, in our first class. We also gave a scholarship um, for a senior, graduated senior, to go to culinary school or restaurant management, and he got a uh, first scholarship. And when he uh, came back to the hip hop, after he was in college, came in with his girlfriend and started walking across the dance floor, and I thought my eyes well up, and I thought, you know, I finally know who uh, those kids are, you know, that I was wondering, who are these kids, you know, uh, in high school, I don't know them. They're our children, that all children are our children. Uh, and we had this mentoring program up until the time I sold the restaurant five years ago. So another thing about, the, about business um, is the mantra of grow or die. We have to keep growing our business bigger and bigger uh, in order to be successful. And so people would often say to me, well, how many restaurants do you have? I said, well, I just have one. Uh, and I, I, they said, well, why don't you start one in New York or DC or whatever? Um, and I just didn't feel that I wanted to do that. At first I thought, well, am I a big sissy because I don't want to have a chain, national chain of white dog cafes? Uh, but then I realized that if I were to do that, if I were to have a chain, I would lose what was most essential to me, and that's the authentic relationships that I had, you know, with my employees and my customers and my neighbors and so on. Uh, so I decided um, that I would uh, just grow my business uh, in my own community, and instead of starting a, a white dog in someone else's community, 
I started a black hat in my own community next door to the White Dog uh, because my community didn't have a store where people could buy locally made and, and fair trade uh, gifts. And there's a picture of the inside of the store. It looked, someone pointed out that it looks a little bit like a free people store, a store of a free people store. There's another picture of the inside. So here's another model of business uh, in terms of growing in a different way rather than starting a chain, Zimmerman's Deli, which is a famous deli in Ann Arbor. I was just actually there last weekend uh, speaking. Uh, but instead of starting a chain of delis, uh, they looked to see what their own community needed, and they started a bakery. They started um, a candy company. They started a creamery to make their own cheeses and yogurts and so on. Uh, they started a, um, a coffee roasting company. Uh, they started a full, full service restaurant. Uh, so they have what they call the, a family of businesses. Um, so they were really helping their community by um, providing what, what the community needed and uh, reducing the number of uh, imports of things into the community. You know, through local ownership, that money stays circulating uh, in, in, in the community of, of Ann Arbor. And plus, uh, each time they started a new business, they promoted and, and the outstanding employees to become owners in each of the new businesses. So now there's, uh, I think there's 18 businesses, and I don't know how many um, owners, um, of, um, you know, of, the, of the various uh, businesses. So it's just a marvelous uh, way to, uh, to grow. And so I realized that change, like invasive species, you know, they go into other people's communities and they smother out the indigenous businesses. So then I thought, well, if invasive species is the bad thing, well, how does nature grow? Oh, it's a good way to grow. And I realized that nature grows deeper in place uh, in its own ecosystem. Nature grows to become more complex, more diverse, more resilient, and more adaptive to the needs of its own ecosystem <coughs> or business in its, its own uh, community. So I, I saw that we could grow in other ways besides material growth, that we could grow by increasing our knowledge, by expanding our consciousness, by deepening our relationships, by developing our creativity, by building community, by having more fun. So those are the ways that I, I move uh, the White Dog Cafe. Uh, for instance, we would have table talks with authors or on um, issues of public concern. So there's Patch Adams, um, the doctor that um, talks about how humor is an uh, important part of healing. We had storytelling of giving voice to underrepresented uh, voices, like the Tales from Jail with ex offenders telling their story, or uh, stories of <coughs> immigrants. In this case, it was a same sex marriage story to a gay couple and a lesbian couple. Uh, we did tours of um, the neighborhoods. This was a wall mural tour. Philadelphia is the rural capital of the world. Uh, that's Jane Golden, the uh, founder and director of mural arts. Uh, we were watching, looking to see how a, a mural is developed in the community, how to engage with the whole community in the development of a mural, and a mural under construction. Uh, we brought our customers to see community gardens all throughout the city, a couple of award-winning gardens. Uh, we went to Greater Prison uh, to see the organic growers of Greater Prison and how um, gardening was a way to heal uh, the prisoners. This was an affordable housing tour. We did community service days. Um, once a month we did a, a, a dinner for people suffering from AIDS. Uh, after Katrina, we went down to New Orleans, uh, took 20 customers and staff to help with the gutting of the houses. We had annual events. Uh, Martin Luther King event was the first uh, special event I put on when I, in 1985, and the last one I did um, in uh, January of 2009 uh, when I sold the business. Uh, we did a Freedom Seder uh, every spring at uh, Passover. And we had tons of fun. This was our New Year's Day pajama party brunch uh, where our customers came wearing their pajamas. And this family was amazing. They came every single year and they always wore of matching flannel pajamas, and they always had a new set of pajamas that the grandmother would make for the whole family. They were having their Bloody Marys there. And uh, we just had such a ball on New Year's Day in our pajamas. And then in the summertime, we'd have events outside on the, on the street. And uh, this was our Fourth of July party, the Liberty and Justice for All Ball, on the eve of Fourth of July. And we would have a buffet dinner of fresh, uh, farm fresh food, and then afterwards we put on a little skit called Birth of the Nation. First out would come a, a drummer dressed in colonial um, revolutionary gear. Then I came out as a, a pregnant colonial lady, led by, led by my midwife. 
adult human beings can drink what's meant for a, a baby uh, cow. So when I found out about that, I, I, I've never drunk milk since then. And so we were looking for sources of, of farms where the cow was kept with the mother. But again, it's all about money. That the uh, farmers make less money if they don't if they have to share the milk uh, with with the cow. In the old days, of course, they it was about sharing with them with the, with the cow. The cow could there's for the mother just in the Hawthorne Valley, they keep the cows with the mother for nine months, uh, which is like a, a normal time, and they found great benefits uh, to the to the cat in doing that. So finally, I got this is Dougie, the one that kisses her goat's ears. <laughs> so I finally got to the place where I thought to myself, well, I have a humane menu that all the meat and poultry animal products that the white dog come from small farms where the uh, animals are treated with, with kindness and, and respect. Uh, and this is going to be our market niche. No other <coughs> restaurant in Philadelphia is doing this. This is going to be our competitive advantage. This is all about us. But then I um, thought to myself, well, Judy, if you really do care about those pigs, if you really care about the environment, where there's uh, sometimes there's 10,000 sows in one barn where all that uh, manure goes uh, into a lagoon and that leaks into the, into the rivers and streams in rural areas and into the air and so on. Um, if you care about the workers in these terrible factories and slaughterhouses, and if you care about the consumers that are eating meat that's full of antibiotics and hormones, then rather than um, keeping this as my competitive advantage, I should share this information and these sources with my competitors. So that was a real turning point uh, in my life, uh, because I realized that there was no such thing as one sustainable business, no matter what your practices were, or by local or whatever. You can only be part of a sustainable system, and that you need to cooperate <coughs> in order to, to build that sustainable system. So I asked the farmer, Farmer Glenn, this is at the Dance of the Ripe Tomato, I asked Farmer Glenn uh, if he wanted to expand his business. He was bringing us in two things a week, and we would buy the whole animal. Uh, and he said yes, and I said, well, what's holding you back? And he said he, he needed a refrigerated truck so that he could um, deliver to many restaurants in Philadelphia. So I gave him $30,000 to buy the refrigerated truck uh, so that, that he could uh, deliver to my competitors. And then I started Fair Food, a nonprofit organization. Uh, the office was in my house for the first four years. And the first executive director, Ann Carlin, who's, who's still on the job, um, uh, started in the year 2000, so it's been 15 years now. Uh, and Ann's job in the beginning was to take a list of suppliers from the White Dog, all the farms we bought from, which about 20 farmers, uh, that listed you know, their names, what products they offered, what their phone number was, and so on, and went around to the other restaurants and handed this out. And then that, that little uh, uh, list of suppliers developed into uh, the local food guide, which is now available every year to uh, Philadelphians to, to guide the towards where are the farm stands, where, uh, where are the restaurants that serve a farm fresh food, how can you sign up for CSA, with the CSAs, and so on, to, to, uh, to facilitate the, the, um, the purchase of local food uh, for um, Philadelphians. And we, the Fair Food also started a farm stand in the Reading Terminal. Uh, it's open every day, uh, year round. And we, we sell the products of 90 different uh, farms and uh, small food enterprises, uh, everything from uh, cheese and meat uh, to uh, crackers. We now have locally made crackers. We can put our local cheese and our local crackers and uh, wash it down with local beer. Um, we've got local gin now, so we can have local martinis. <laughs> My favorite gin, blue coat gin. So another really important experience uh, for me, which really took me into uh, a global uh, perspective, uh, was uh, going down to Chiapas, Mexico. Uh, through my International Sister Restaurant Program, I had learned about the Zapatista uprising in Chiapas on January 1st, 1994. And I was wondering, you know, why are the Zapatistas having this, this uprising um, on the day that NAFTA went into effect? So I found out in going down there that it was because they predicted when borders were lowered between Mexico and the uh, United States that cheap uh, corn from the corporate corn growers in the U.S. that was subsidized by our tax dollars through the Farm Bill would be dumped into Mexico, putting out of business the small indigenous corn farmers there, which is exactly what happened and caused a huge wave of Im uh, legal immigration of Mexicans uh, to the United States, which was caused by our own, po our own policies, which we never, uh, never really discussed. Um, so, um, Anyway, I, I became really fascinated with the Zapatistas because they said that what they, why they had a revolution is that they were saying no mas, no more, that they would not uh, give up their local self-reliance. I never really thought about local self-reliance. What is that? They, they, they wanted to maintain their 
ability to sell their corn in the domestic marketplace and be able to raise their own uh, fruits and vegetables to feed their own families. Uh, they wanted to maintain their, their own culture um, to, uh, to uh, teach their kids in their own language uh, with their own values um, and not maintain their traditions and not be sucked into a, uh, a corporate uh, global economy of Western lifestyle. Uh, they wanted to maintain their, their identity, their cultural identity, um, and wear the clothes that their, uh, the women have been weaving for hundreds of years and not be forced to leave their farms and villages and work in the Kiladoras, you know, the sweatshops along the border of the U.S., uh, exporting uh, clothes uh, to the U.S. and, and um, in Europe. So uh, I, I started to see the relationship between what was happening to the farmers in Chiapas with the farmers in Pennsylvania, that our farmers were also being uh, driven off by our failed policies by the farm bill that gives uh, unfair advantage to over, uh, growers over small uh, family farms and, and also forced out by development. Uh, and I began to realize that across uh, the, the globe that small uh, economies were being crushed uh, by corporate globalization and that communities everywhere were losing our self-reliance, that we uh, were dependent on large corporations to deliver our food and our energy and our clothes from far away. Uh, that we weren't producing uh, what we needed to survive in our own communities. Uh, so I started envisioning a different global economy, which was a network of sustainable local economies, mm -hmm. where basic needs like food and energy and clothing and, and um, building materials are produced uh, at, at home, at the locally. And then we, we trade globally in things that we have access of for what we don't have, whether it's bananas or coffee or whatever. And we also trade uh, the uniqueness of our own communities, what our own local entrepreneurs and innovators have come up with uh, that uh, can be traded, you know, like a, a new fashion or an in a innovation, invention of a great cheese or wine, and that, that we trade these things uh, throughout the, the country or, or around the world, uh, but it's not what we need to actually uh, live on. And in these times of uh, climate change, I realized how important it was to have local self-reliance, just as the Zapatistas had taught me. So I ended up founding this organization called the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, Bali. And we do three, thing, three things. We, we connect the leaders uh, that are working in local economies uh, to build those local economies. And we spread the solutions of what's working in one community uh, to another. And we drive investment away from the stock market uh, and into local communities to, to fund local businesses. Uh, and we work in about 80, 85 communities um, in Canada and the United States. So uh, what we're about in this local economy movement is about local business ownership and the retailers give our communities unique uh, identity and culture uh, and the local manufacturers uh, <coughs> give us uh, more security and, and, and more uh, uh, of our basic needs produced locally. Uh, we're about investing locally uh, to fund the businesses that we need to become self-reliant. Uh, we're about prosperity for all, that as we build a new economy, um, replacing the corporate controlled global economy with a community-based green economy, we want to make sure that there's a business opportunities uh, for, for all. Uh, and we're about changing public policy to support local economies, uh, because so many of our policies, like the Farm Bill, bill are weighted towards uh, the corporations to um, give the advantages to corporations over communities. And one of the most important things that we can do is to get money out of politics because uh, the Supreme Court decision of Citizens United uh, gives unlimited ability for corporations to fund our elections. And so uh, we no longer really have much of a democracy left because our politicians are all uh, funded by corporations and we need to change that. So I'm very much a fan of this uh, program called the Stamp Stampede that's, that's uh, stamping our, our bills with these signs that say not to be used for bribing politicians. Um, and it's part of a movement to uh, have a constitutional amendment uh, to overturn the Supreme Court decision to get money out of politics. And I actually have a uh, stamp at the table when I'm, when I'm selling uh, books over there or the bookstore selling books and I can stamp your money with that or if you want to buy a stamp of your own, I have them. Uh, and spread the word about this important uh, movement. So here we are. This is our local uh, Bali network, the Sustainable Business Network of Greater Philadelphia, which I also uh, founded out of the White Dog, and, and this was one of our board meetings up in the Poconos, a, a retreat. 
uh, and there's real uh, collective joy, you know, and working together toward a shared vision uh, for, for our community. And I'll, I'll read a, a final passage here. Our, tradi our traditional capitalist economic system has perpetuated a worldview of separation by teaching individualism and competition viewing nature as a resource to be exploited, measuring success and self-worth by material wealth, and giving us the false notion that only money brings security. As I see it, greed and violence often come from a lack of faith. Faith as I saw in the Eskimo village, that the universe is abundant and can provide for everyone if we're willing to share, cooperate, and live in harmony with all of life. In working towards such a world, local living economies are shifting consciousness by modeling these values and demonstrating that our real security, as well as our happiness, lies in strong, self-reliant communities within a healthy web of life. By building a new economy uh, in which every community has food and water security and locally produced renewable energy, we are creating the foundation for world peace. We can reinvent what it is to be an American. Rather than a country of rugged individuals, we can be a country of rugged communities. Perhaps we always have been. So ultimately, uh, we belong to the vibrant community um, of life on Earth. We are not uh, separate from nature, but we are a part of nature, uh, interconnected with all people and all of life on Earth. But what we do to nature and to other people eventually comes back to us and to our children's children. Our fossil fuel-based uh, economy with little connection to place and with so much uh, efficiency and little nurturing has greatly diminished this vibrant community of life on Earth while creating a great inequality at the same time. Nature creates the conditions for more life, uh, while our present economy is actually destroying the life on Earth. There is urgency in the work ahead, a race against time to stop climate change and environmental decline before this vibrant community uh, is diminished beyond repair. Though our localism a movement is not only reducing the carbons of long distance shipping and, care and caring for our local ecosystems, but we're also preparing our communities for impact of climate change by building local self-reliance and basic needs. We're moving forward uh, by pursuing a small scale on a large scale. The transformation um, of our economy uh, from life destroying to life giving uh, begins with awakening our hearts, uh, awakening the heart of the entrepreneur, awakening the heart of the investor, and of all of us uh, as consumers, moving from a worldview um, of separation uh, a demonos, fear-based, kill be killed worldview that is really callous towards the suffering of others, to a love-based worldview of interconnection. Uh, and this is really foundational to the evolution of mankind on Earth. When we believe that all life is interconnected, uh, spiritually and environmentally, we can feel our connection to the suffering pigs. We can feel our connection to the polluted rivers and the dying fish. We can feel our connection to the struggling small farmers. As we address climate change, toxicity, and greed, uh, let us feel the grief of losing the elephants and the songbirds and the honeybees and the gorillas, the whales and the butterflies that are all our relations here uh, on planet Earth. My own awakening uh, fully blossomed when I made the decision to share with my competitors, and that was the moment when I moved from me to we. Uh, at the time, I was at every restaurant for itself uh, mentality. Uh, I thought that my goal was simply to have good practices within my own company, you know, recycling and composting and buying local and whatnot, but that's not enough. Because I was limited in my thinking uh, to really focus just on the farmers delivering to my restaurant, building a network that served me. But in this transformational moment, uh, I began to envision a whole system, a whole local food system and realized that I needed to enlarge my the network that I had begun to build a whole local economy that shared the values for humane and sustainable farming. And I moved from competition uh, to cooperation. Up until that time, I was a competitive business person, uh, competing to be the most sustainable, uh, but nevertheless competing. And when I grew up, uh, we were taught that nature itself is competitive. Uh, that's the survival of the fittest, and that mankind has survived through domination and competition and violence. But uh, in, in more uh, contemporary times, it's been discovered that nature is actually uh, cooperative uh, uh, in, in its basic uh, way of 
relating to each other, to different entities and species. That yes, there is competition within the cooperative system, just like in our local food system, we cooperate with that system, but then the chefs all compete to see how they can use those local ingredients in the most creative way uh, to have the best dishes. Uh, so, you know, this is a shift that's going on now that you see more and more often, like e uh, Elon Musk of uh, Tesla, uh, electric cars last summer, um, gave up all his intellectual property. He um, get, made public uh, 1,200, 1,300, 1,400 uh, Tesla patents um, because he realizes that we have to manufacture electric cars as fast as possible, that we all have to put everything we have uh, into getting enough electric cars out there so that we can get off of oil. I mean, it's just appalling to me how these uh, trains are blowing up, you know, with oil in them. Uh, in my neighborhood, uh, two houses blew up from uh, natural gas leaks, the right center city of Philadelphia, that this is a dangerous world uh, that we live in with uh, natural gas and oil. Uh, and it's not just the immediate danger, but the danger of, of climate change. Uh, so we're also moving from according to sharing, as I learned, learned from the Eskimos, and once you begin to share, um, and uh, it's contagious, you know. Uh, and so I just kept sh sharing more and more and developing a whole uh, culture of, uh, of sharing, as the Eskimos did. And life is, is abundant, so we don't have to fight over these resources. And lastly, but probably most importantly, moving from fear to love, because when I made that decision to share with my competitors, at first I was afraid. You know, I was afraid that my profits would go down, my sales would go down. And I, I ended up, I didn't make the decision because I figured out in my head, uh, this is the right thing to do. I made the decision because I loved the pigs. I felt it in my heart. And it was really my love of animals, of nature, of community that was greater uh, than my fear. When we love our places and take responsibility for them, when we open our hearts and lead with love, we can build a just, sustainable, and joyful economy. If we succeed in leaving a viable future for our children and for the children of all species, it will be because <coughs> mankind has evolved uh, to take our rightful place in the community of life, not as exploiters, but as lovers. Thank you very much.
but um, we have to get a permit uh, for a charging station. We had to take a parking place in front of our house and then run the line out there to charge it with. But the problem is that once you, you, you get a permit and you do all that, then any electric car can park in your place. So you can come home and someone else could be hooked up to your own electricity. You know? So it's not really totally thought out yet. So there needs to be you know, some central planning by the cities and townships or whatever uh, to figure out about where the charging station is going to be. And in our you could probably do one right in your, in your, in your garage. But in the city, it's a lot harder. So really, there's probably no, no obstacle to getting electric cars in, in our group. And can you imagine never having any, to go to the gas station again for the rest of your life? And these cars are great, and they, could, they go fast. And if people think electric cars, they just are like little golf carts or something. But no, they're sports cars that go 100 miles an hour and whatnot. Um, so I think it's really important to do, to do that. Um, and also, as much as possible, to have our homes run by electric, uh, electricity. Um, I, I moved five years ago, and I wasn't as I wasn't as conscious then when I put in um, a gas top stove because I thought natural gas was uh, a good thing, uh, and I have a, a natural gas furnace as well. But now I realize that it's not, you know, uh, that it's a fossil fuel too. That we have to switch to renewable energy. It's the only only answer. Um, so if I had to do it again, I'd put in a uh, you know a electric uh, stove. I'd put in an electric furnace. Uh, and if you sign up for 100% renewable energy, then you're, you're off oil, you know, and get an electric car, you're off oil there too, and off natural gas. So those are things that every individual can do without, uh, you know, government. Uh, so, and we can all buy from farmers markets. Um, we can, you know, clothing is one of the hardest things because there's not that much available yet. Um, I, I buy some clothing, uh, you know, because it's uh, uh, made from, Sustainable fabrics like I need fishers or, or really, really in terms of you know larger companies. It's, a, it's not local, but at least she uses only re renewable um, fabrics and non-toxic dyes. I mean, the fabric um, textile industry is one of the greatest pollu polluters you know in the world. Um, so getting clothes that, that are non-polluting, sustainable production, and buying local as much as possible. We had a lovely local. Uh, dress shop in Philadelphia that actually made the clothes upstairs and they went out of business. And I was so, I wrote about them in my book. I was so heartbroken about that. But I think that's going to be coming along. There are places in New York City, Portland, um, Oregon, where the local clothing industry is really thriving. Uh, and there's just tons of little shops uh, with locally made clothes um, and local, locally owned stores. So that's kind of coming along. Um, but I think there's a lot that we individuals can do. Um, that we shouldn't feel disempowered in this, uh, in this situation. Um, and I, I certainly hope that the that, that government steps up. It's just unbelievable that the United States doesn't have a master plan you know, of switching all of our infrastructure to renewable energy, uh, that we're still building natural gas plants. We're still destroying our communities with fracking, uh, polluting our water. I mean, it's just insane. Uh, so I'm hoping that people will, will wake up. But we can all do things in our own lives. Uh, uh, to, you know, for our own health as well as for our children. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, um, wonderful talk. Thank um, you. Number two, I know you talked about leading as well. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about that process, because again, sometimes you'll deal with a lot of naysayers when you make that switch, and what was that length of time? So like, you woke up the next morning and said, I had to do it, and um, so what was that process like as well as how did you do it? Well, um, you know, my big turning point was when I decided to share with my competitors. And it wasn't like it was a, a you know, a aha moment, something like I brewed over for a while. Um, and I, I just couldn't stop thinking about the pigs. You know, you saw that picture, you know, and I just couldn't, uh, I realized that, you know, that um, I needed, I, I didn't want my competitors to buy the pigs that were kept like that as well. So it was really, I didn't describe it as leading with love when I did it. <laughs> it was after I wrote, when I was reading my writing my book and like trying to uh, understand myself and be able to articulate that I realized what it was. Uh, and, and people will ask me questions and, and, I'll, and I'll say, well, how did you come to that conclusion? Well, I realized, well, I didn't come to the conclusion. Like I didn't think it out. I felt it out. Um, so you know, it's not a. Um, and I and I think that that found. found Foundationally, it's about having that worldview of interconnection. Uh, that when we when we really feel that interconnection with other with animals and people and so on, 
uh, th then you know that's that whole worldview that's love based and um, cooperation based and so on. And right now, I, I feel like there you know that our own country uh, is at war with itself between people who are uh, fear based and people that are love based. Um, and you know the, the extremists um, uh, are all about fear based. But I feel like we have some Christian extremists in this country, you know, that are really hate hateful. You know, you hear them on talk radio and everywhere else. Uh, so you know, uh, there's fear based. Uh, it's a clash of worldviews of, of people who see that we're all separate and we have to kill or be killed. And you do anything to survive, and you have to dominate to, to win. Um, and the, and the, the other worldview that we're, we're all connected. There is no other. There is no them and us. We're all interconnected. Uh, and that there's God in everybody. Um, and uh, you know, I had these arguments with my aunt. She's like a right-wing Christian extremist. <laughs> and uh, she doesn't think there's God in everybody. You know, and that's the, that's the problem. Uh, you know, they think, oh, well, they're, you know, we've got to kill them because, if, you know, they're, they're, they don't have God in them. But we all do. And I think once, if you believe that, that that's, that's foundational to leading love. up. You know, when you know that we're all connected spiritually and environmentally. Um, and it's also, uh, you know, um, it's uh, enlightened self-interest. You know, because what we do to others comes back to us. If we want to have, uh, have peace and happiness, then we need to have peace and happiness for, for all people. Have justice, peace, and justice. You know, Martin Luther King used to say that. You know, so he, so well. I can't repeat his, his quotes, but he used to talk about how we're all interconnected. Uh, and he led the love. You know, and um, you know, in my book, I talk a lot about uh, King and, and Gandhi. They were my heroes, and uh, I think you know, in history, that those were two people that led the love. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Um, the world population has six billion. Thinks we might have to think about taking another step in eating less animal protein. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm glad you made that that point. Um, you know, it's it's really. Uh, I don't think we have to do. I, I I eat meat, but I feel like eating meat should be a special occasion. Um, and we, you know, we think we have to eat meat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and we don't. It's not healthy for us, especially not healthy to eat uh, meat from the factory farm system that's pumped full of all these you know drugs and stuff. Uh, but I feel like meat should be a special occasion, um, you know, as it has been, you know, with indigenous people that they really honor, you know, you kill a, a buffalo or, you know, whatever, you, you really honor that life that you've taken um, and uh, that it's for a special, special occasion. Um, so I definitely feel that there's not, you know, that I don't know the, the statistics, but they, they talk about how much is, uh, energy does it um, cost to uh, raise a, a, a cow, you know, versus growing the corn, eating the corn and wheat and everything that the cow eats. Um, and, you know, there's just uh, such a waste um, of water as well as, uh, as uh, food um, in feeding all these animals. And we're, we're tearing down the rainforest uh, to, to grow uh, soy to feed to animals. Uh, so it's just a, a vicious cycle. And now the, you know, the Chinese and Indians are all wanting to eat more meat because it's more prestigious and so on. And, it just uh, should be going the other way. Uh, that we should be more vegetarians and, and vegans, um, as, as more the culture in India has been traditionally. So it's a very good point. To, uh, I think that we should eat less meat, and when we eat meat, we should be very conscious of where it came from um, and respect uh, the animal. Any other questions? Yes. Um, hi, Judy. I grew up with your restaurant. And attend many a uh, Friday night and Sunday brunch. And uh huh. Great. Always have wonderful fond memories. Um, I was wondering what your relationship is. You said you sold the restaurant. Do you still have a relationship with the restaurant now? Yes. And do you also have one with the restaurant in Wayne? Uh, yes. This is a situation. I I had nothing to do with starting the one in Wayne. Uh, when I sold the restaurant, I kept ownership of the name, like Dog Cafe, mm -hmm. and I licensed the name to the new owners with a social contract that requires them to buy from farmers and use only humane raised meat, um, sign up for renewable energy and so on, a fair trade chocolate, uh, coffee, tea, vanilla, cinnamon and so on. So the values are kind of baked into the into the name. And they're allowed to start other white dogs uh, as long as the, it's 
within 50 miles of where the primary owner lives, so they can't start a national chain where there's not local ownership. Um, so there's been some issues around that uh, lately, um, and I, you know, uh, I, I need to deal with that. I need to deal with. Um, but uh, it's been five years now, um, and in the beginning there was a lot of issues, and we got them settled, and then I just did an audit and found some problems. So, um, but I, you know, overall I think it's a, a good way of doing things. If I were to do it over again, what I would do is have penalties, you know, like for every day they were serving, uh, using chocolate that wasn't uh, fair trade, mm -hmm. that they would be charged $100 a day or something. But my only penalty is taking the name back. Uh, and that's a huge thing, of course. Um, and and also that's how I get also get, I get paid. I, I you know I license it because the cost of the restaurant when I sold it was very much lower the, the um, much lower price uh, because I didn't sell the name. The name was very valuable, more valuable than the business. So um, I didn't care about getting all the money up front because I I wasn't starting another business with it. Uh, so what the licensing agreement does is stress the payments out over 15 years because they're paying for the name over a 15-year period while they're holding those values. Uh, so over 15 years, I get paid the whole amount that the restaurant was worth. Uh, but so far, I have not got paid that much since I've been five years. Um, so um, anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a good deal for the buyer and the seller because it stresses the payments out, uh, and it's a good deal in terms of embedding the values. Um, but it's a little bit of pain in the ass because I have to monitor them. <laughs> But um, yeah, but I think it's, it's so far, it's, I haven't heard of a better way to, to, to keep the values, because that's often the problem when you sell business, is the values are lost. Yes, in the back. Has your model been replicated anywhere? Or are you asked to speak at schools or <coughs> the business model of the white dog? I, I speak a, a, a lot. Um, uh, how many people have, you know, have replicated, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I know like all the programming that we used to do is very difficult. I mean, I don't know any other restaurant that does that, the programming, mm -hmm. but there's certainly a lot of restaurants that buy from local farmers. Um, and Fair Food has been, you know, a real catalyst in that. And, and uh, they provide consulting to restaurants on how to buy from farmers and so on. So I think that is, has been, um, we have a good model for that, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Um, you know, I, I don't, it's hard to say about other, other things because you don't know how many, I mean, I get a lot of emails from people uh, or comments from students, you know, uh, telling me that I, that I inspired them to do business uh, in a new way. Um, so I'm, I would like to speak in more business schools because I feel like that's really crucial to uh, the new economy of, of reaching the business students at a young age. Um, and um, so I, but I, it, it's, it's hard, you know. Uh, I don't know whether, like, Warden would really want me. <laughs> uh, but, but I must say that, 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 that local has really taken off. I mean, yeah, people yes. get this, yeah. you know, that we need to bring power back to our communities. Mm -hmm. And you know, the whole country's been taken over by corporations, or government's been taken over, or culture, you know, so much has been taken over by large corporations. And, you know, by, by buying local, and, and we, we can take it back. <coughs> uh, so, I think it is something that's growing. Yes? Yeah, this is more of a personal question. Um, Vista, Vista 1970, Puerto Rico. Oh, great. Okay, and why did you go that way instead of Peace Corps? Well, the Peace Corps was harder to get into and took longer. Okay. Um, and it was, of course, as you know, it was during the Vietnam War, and uh, my husband was draftable as so, soon as he graduated from. from um, College, so we had to get in somewhere as quickly as possible. And we were afraid if we waited to go through the, through the whole Peace Corps thing, he would get drafted. Okay. And as it was, while we were up there in, in Alaska, um, they switched to the, the lottery system where they drew the, the numbers, uh, which was a much fairer way to do it. Sure. It was really wrong that um, college students were exempted, where poor kids were drafted. Okay. A poor, horrible situation. Uh, but after they changed that to have a, a more fair system, then all of a sudden uh, a lot of people were against the war for the first time because they didn't want their kid to go, you know. Uh, but luckily, you know, uh, for, for, for us, my husband got a really low uh, low number or high number or whatever was the better one. Uh, so he, he wasn't drafted. Uh, but that, that, was, that was part of it. That was part of why we went. I mean, I was really interested in doing that kind of work anyway um, and just the adventure of it. We, referred, we, we um, requested to go to a large eastern city and we were first sent to train in a, we're going to a, a Indian reservation in the West, 
And while we were training for that, uh, they asked our group, there's maybe 100, 200 people there, if anyone would uh, volunteer to go to an Eskimo village in Alaska, and it had to be a married couple. Um, and so we thought, well, we wanted to go to a large eastern city, and we're not going there, so why don't we go to Alaska? <laughs> so we went, you know, and it, it really changed my life, so it was great. Sure. It, and I really feel that, you know, part of uh, my, my desire, you know, to have cooperation sharing came, came from that experience. Yeah. Um, and living there for a whole year, it really was embedded. Um, and I could see that it was a happier way. But uh, again, it's sort of subconscious in a sense, and, and more in the heart. That I share those emotions. Uh -huh. Great. Thank you. Yes, Danielle. You're just a line of slow moving. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, the question is about the Bali Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. It's a, a national network, and the locally <coughs> sustainable business network is, is a member of Bali. Um, and, but individuals can join Bali, but you can also join SBN here in Philadelphia, uh, and then you'd be hooked into local events uh, that are here. Then nationally, we have a conference once a year. Uh, if you go to the website, which is bealocalist.org, uh, you can learn more about Bali, but we have a, um, a conference in June. This year it's going to be in Phoenix, Arizona. I think it's June 12, 13, 14, something like that. But each, each year it's in a different place. And we really study the local economy where we are. And it's hosted by a strong local network. So the Arizona Local First um, group is kind of hosting it this year. And this is our 13th national conference. And they're, they're really lots of fun, you know, local food and local music and, um, and just hearing what's going on around the country. Uh, we usually have about seven or eight hundred people at our conferences, um, and it's, it's, been, it's been going well. We've been really focusing on um, on a, a program that, we're, that we call the, the Fellows Program, a fellowship program, where we identify le le outstanding leaders in, in the country, and then we give them leadership training and and connect them to each other. So there's a you know, peer group to support each other because it's kind of lonely work, and it, it seems like an uphill battle. You know, <laughs> you see all the chain stores and so on. So it's really important that these local leaders uh, have support from each other and, and get leadership training and, and uh, feel fortified for this work. So. Okay, if there's any more questions, I'm going to go over to sign some books. Uh, thank you all for We have a raffle that uh, you submitted earlier. There are two names out the raffle. Okay. That's the first one. KYIP. Okay. 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 Okay.